Released in March 2009, Racing the Beam was a book written by Ian Bogust and Nick Montfort, which covers the history and development of the Atari VCS-2600. It is broken into eight chapters, six of which cover the system's earliest groundbreaking games. They are Combat, Adventure, Pac-Man, Yars Revenge, Pitfall, and Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. Although there are chapters specifically covering these games, there are a few detours into other classics, including Grand Prix, Freeway, Star Castle, Defender, Barnstorming, among others. The book is written in more of a technical, academic textbook sort of way. They do cover technical aspects of the VCS, which is necessary in order to properly understand the unit's limitations. The book derived its name literally from the fact that in the early days of television, there was an electron beam that shot across the screen many times a second, moving both horizontally and vertically. Certain calculations have to be made in between electron gun movements in order to display the graphics properly. You in effect are literally racing the beam across the screen. This was due to the fact that the VCS did not have a video frame buffer. From this book I also learned of another technical constraint of the VCS. It did not have character ROM like you find, for example, on the Commodore 64. This made printing characters on the screen, even the score, much more challenging. This is one of the reasons why you don't see many text-based game cartridges on the system. After covering the television interface adapter, TIA, otherwise known as Stella, in the first chapter, the book moves on to the groundbreaking games released for the VCS. The first such game in Chapter 2 is Combat. Combat was the pack-in game that was included with the console upon purchase. This was the game that was intended to show off all the capabilities that the VCS had to offer. The thing that I am most impressed about Combat is that it has 27 variations, which is all stuffed into a 2K cartridge. On a technical side, from the book, I learned a few new things. The sprites in Combat had a double sizing technique, and I also learned the VCS has a screen mirroring mechanism, whereby whatever image is on the left side of the screen can be automatically mirrored to the right side, which saves memory and CPU cycles. Chapter 3 covers a groundbreaking game that I recently reviewed, Adventure. The book goes into detail about how the game's author and programmer Warren Robinette gained his inspiration for the game, which was from the PDP-10 text program, also called Adventure. His idea was to take the concept from a text game and reimagine how to turn it into a graphical adventure. Next up, Pac-Man. In this chapter I learned the VCS has the capability of flipping sprites horizontally through a hardware register. This eliminates the need to store an extra sprite. This option does not exist for flipping in the vertical direction. Since the programmer was constrained on both time and on cartridge space, corners had to be cut with regards to arcade accuracy. Having said that, Pac-Man was the top-selling Atari 2600 game with over 7 million copies sold. Next up, Yars Revenge. I learned how Howard Scott Warshaw gained inspiration from the arcade game Star Castle. Once he discovered the VCS would not be capable of properly emulating the arcade's graphics, he instead fostered his own version of the game, which had enough variations to become an original game of its own. Yars Revenge went on to become Atari's best-selling non-arcade ported video game. It was so successful they even seriously contemplated porting it to the arcade. Next up, Pitfall. Pitfall was one of the first multi-screen platformer style games available on the Atari VCS. I was amazed how David Crane came up with the initial concept for this game. It all started with a running man animation he had come up with. From there, he needed a reason for it to be running. He thought of the jungle, and voila, Pitfall was born. It had 255 mazes, used a polynomial counter algorithm to keep track of the mazes, and they were all fit into a mere 50 bytes of cartridge space. This was not a quarter munching type of game. It had a 20 minute timer. Quoting from the book, the 20 minute single player session was an innovation which helped establish the experience of home console play. Next up, Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. This was the first video game based on any Star Wars movie. This chapter covered a lot about video game licensing since Parker Brothers owned the license for both toys and games. They were under the belief that this also entitled them to the video game software license. This video game made great use of the 128 color palette and it had a short recognizable tune that doubled as an introduction and in-game music. Overall, I learned a lot from Racing the Beam and I'm glad I read it. The book has been out for over seven years now, and I wish I had discovered it sooner. It has a dry tone and reads a lot like a college textbook, in that it covered technical topics and had a teacher-slash-student vibe. I don't think anyone ever imagined the Atari VCS-slash-2600 would have ever had the long-term success that it has had.
Were it not for the discoveries, innovations, and breakthroughs by the early programmers and written about in this book, that may never have happened. Understanding the technical intricacies of the VCS, following the beam, so to speak, along with the creative thinking of the early developers are what helped make this platform flourish. Not to mention the brilliant design engineering of the system to begin with. A system which was initially intended for simple Pong style games. Racing the Beam goes into significant detail on these historical points and is a fairly quick read, clocking in at about 150 pages. It is part of MIT Labs Platform Studies series and can be found on Amazon.com in both hardcover and digital formats. Highly recommended.